I always think about turning it on the recorder, but it's always too late. Okay. So we've got um, we've got Jake, we've got Jay Crockman, Joe Blanchett, Paul Frieda, Robert Miller, and Peter Kafka. Have I missed anybody? No. I think Robert Miller dropped off. Robert Miller may have been on and may have dropped off. Okay. All right. So this is a small crew. I'm expecting Jim Cameron. Um, and if Jim comes on, then we'll have a pretty interesting conversation about his diagnosis. Um, but before we get there, um, Joel, I know I recognize your name from the Moyad um, presentation. Is this the first time that you've actually been with us on a group? Uh, yes, correct. Um, I, can you hear me okay? We can hear you great. Great. Um, yeah, I'm a group leader of the uh, US2 group in Sterling, Virginia. Okay. And I, I just heard about you uh, through the Moyad presentation, and I just wanted to tune in and see uh, uh, how I could be more helpful to the group or if, uh, uh, if we could share education or whatever. Um, and well. so uh, I don't have advanced prostate cancer, but my last DSA was a point two. And I'm getting there, but I haven't got there yet. So mm -hmm. uh, anyway, um, that's where that's where I come from. Well, we're not we we don't only have advanced. We have people with recurrent, and um, we have people with high risk. So if you sadly fall into the recurrent phase, you're you are definitely in the right group. Are you? Uh, what was your original treatment, Joe? Yeah, prostatectomy, and uh, I am in a recurrent phase. Uh, I started picking up positive PSA six months after surgery six years ago, and uh, I'm now up to uh, my my PSA has gradually been coming up uh, now at 0.2. I was reading on the US2 website today that uh, 0.2 is considered uh, uh, biochemical failure for the VA because I am a veteran of Vietnam. And so, it can you confirm that, whether point two is a biochemical failure according to the Veterans Administration? <laughs> um, I'm, I guess one thing, one thing at a time here. Um, yes, I would say that um, depending on how long it's taken you to get there, point two could be definitely considered as a um, as a recurrence although you know there are some doctors that think you recur at 0.075 there are some doctors that think you recur at 0.4 or 0.5 and a lot of it depends on how long it, it took you to get there um, so that 0.2 is not really a hard and fast rule but it, it it's a good guidance at the same time you know it does look like you've got to address some sort of future treatment uh, and the question is what so maybe what we could do um maybe you can give us just a little bit more just run through if, if you'd like to do it if you're comfortable because usually what we do is we'll accord new guys uh new people on the group um a little bit of time just to discuss their situation if you would like to do that and you know if you want to just sort of take us back to the beginning i guess 2011 and your psa levels your gleasons and all of that and then we, right. we, you can ask the guys what they think whether what they whether they think you should jump in whether they think you should wait okay that's appreciated that thank you um my grandfather died of prostate cancer on my father's side my father died of prostate cancer and at age 66, I was diagnosed with prostate cancer because I had some bumps on the outside of the prostate. Um, my uh, Gleason was 3 plus 4. My PSA was 3.8. That's been my highest PSA was 3.8. Gleason 3 plus 4. Um, positive margins on the, on the uh, uh, report, the radiological report. Uh, and 
So uh, since then, I've done no treatments whatsoever. Um, um, is, I'm up to uh, uh, up to 0.2 as of last week. I was at 0.16 before that, 0.17 before that. Um, so um, it's gradually coming up. Uh, Dr. Moyad, from what his talk was on the telephone, uh, seemed to suggest that uh, multi-parametric MRI would be a good deal, a uh, thing to do at this point, and also possibly hormone therapy. I'm a little fuzzy about hormone therapy because I'm not sure if hormone therapy kills cancer or just delays the cancer. But he seemed to think it would kill the cancer uh, if it's in the rest of my body other than the local, um, other than the local area. Now, from what I've understood so far through my prostate cancer education is that if you had a, a prostate surgery, you only have a 33% chance of the cancer being in the local area. 66% chance it would be in the rest of the body. Um, so um, the, the thing is, I need to find out where the cancer is. The radiation oncologists just want to radiate regardless of whether they know whether cancer is or not. Uh, they just want to radiate the prostate dead, uh, whether, you know, without knowing if there's actual cancer there or not. So that's where I am. I'm, I'm in a quandary as to what to do next. Mm -hmm. Well, a um, couple, couple of things immediately. It sounds, so you, you, you were diagnosed at age 66 in 2011, is that right? That is correct, August okay. 2011. With a, no, I'm sorry, I had surgery. I was diagnosed earlier than that, yeah. Oh, you, you, were di you had your surgery in 2011, but you were diagnosed before that? Uh, probably January 2011. Yeah, okay. So, and you have a family history. Um, and you had positive margins, but there was no follow-up to those positive margins? Uh, by follow-up, you mean? Well, given that you had positive margins, they didn't suggest to you that you do radiation immediately? Um, um, no, not really. Hmm. It was a bit left up to me, basically. They left it up to you with positive margins. Was this, um, you, I assume you were treated at the VA, correct? No, I was treated uh, in, uh, in Fairfax, um, uh, Inova a Hospital, uh, by a doctor urologist by the name of uh, Simon Chung. He had done 500 prostatectomies before me. Uh, 500, yeah, 500. And uh, so I chose him because he had, than uh, most most in, the, in this Washington DC area. Mm -hmm. I mean, I just it, it's just unusual if you have positive margins that they don't advise additional treatment. At least unusual to me, and I've been I've been in this game now since about 2007, and most of the time, if there's if there's a positive margin, then they are going to suggest that. Um, that you do some sort of follow-up treatment right there and then. At the same time, in your case, you know, it, it's gone pretty slowly, so the disease isn't that aggressive. Um, and, and I think probably most people would say, well, why not radiate at least in the immediate area um, and maybe across the pelvic girdle and, and do three or four months of hormone therapy and see if that doesn't do the trick for you, which, which there's a good chance it may do. Um, uh, Peter, do you, do you want to, with, with your Novocaine mouth, can you comment on this? Would you like to ask um, Joel any questions? Uh, yeah, I, I went back and I lasted about 11 months before my PSA jumped to point two, and then I I, w I went for radiation uh, 11 months after my prostatectomy, uh, and it was to again it was to the prostate bed and uh, and pelvic girdle, um, and I'll, I'm kind of waiting to see how long I go this time. Uh, but I, d I did 18 months of, of uh, ADT as well, but but mine was a far more aggressive disease. I kind of knew that I was I was headed to radiation. Mm -hmm. Just kind of waiting to see how long I could wait before I had to go. Um, but you're only, you're only at least in seven, and I, uh, amazingly enough, there's quite a few guys that uh, 
that I know of that are Gleason 7s that you know seem to have to do additional treatment about five, six years down the road. Uh, and, it, and it's often radiation. I tend to agree with you that there, there might be some kind of a, some kind of a spread beyond the prostate bed, but I don't know if uh, you, you'd have to, even at point two, I don't think you'd pick it up with any kind of a, any kind of scan. You've got to wait till it gets like two, two point something in order for a, a really good scan to pick up anything that might, might be metastatic in the body. So, uh, you know, a, a good, yeah. a good uh, radiation oncologist or a good uh, medical oncologist might suggest at point two going for uh, IMRT radiation and, um, and and just working with the prostate bed. That would be my guess. I don't know. Yeah, my concern is that the radiation is going to do more damage than the prostate cancer. Um, uh, to the to the surrounding organs and so on, um, and maybe even uh, secondary bladder cancer later on. Um, so um, um, the doc, my urologist said that he uh, said that waiting was not a bad thing because I wasn't at a stage yet, uh, unless I was in a the cancer was doubling every three months, the PSA was doubling every three months. That uh, uh, there was plenty of time for me to take action. So that he recommended not doing anything until until uh, PSA you know started to go up much faster. Uh, that was his that philosophy. That makes a lot. That makes a lot of sense. That makes a lot of sense to me. And you've made it six years now, and it, it's only point two, and you're not you're not doubling. Yeah, you you could you could wait a long time, and nothing much is going to go on. Um. A couple, a couple of other things. One is that the, the statistic that I've heard of, um, you mentioned that 66% of men have systemic uh, um, prostate cancer uh, after surgery. I, I had, my understanding was that 35%, it could be 33% of men have recurrence. 66% of men do not have recurrence. But that is recurrence now. Is that recurrence systemic? Hard to say. But they, but they, it does come back and they do need treatment. Um, th there are a couple of guys uh, that we've had on this call recently. And what, I want, I'd like Jay Kruckman to comment because he's wrestling with much the same situation. And, um, and we've had a um, fellow on the call uh, a couple of times recently, but he isn't on today. Who in in Berkeley, California, who, who also is addressing much the same situation. Jay, this sounds. Uh, does this set situation sound familiar to you at all? Uh, it does. Um, I think, as mentioned before, but one of the things I think I have going is is the doubling time. And mine is probably forty five to fifty days of doubling time. But I've now just reached that point two uh, mark again. I had a prostatectomy. Um, I did have radiation, and I have had one bout with uh, with hormone treatment as well. So it, uh, it's familiar. But I think you know my my situation. It's just the um, I'm at the point right now. I have to going to have to make a decision here um, as my doubling time is, is quite quick. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, anyone else? On the call, I'd like to say anything to to, to Joel about um, about his situation, or Joel, would you like to ask any questions of anyone on the call? Yeah, just one more uh, point of fact. Uh, I did take the decipher test, and it, the results were intermediate, so I was in between again. So uh, uh, already knew I had intermediate cancer, but I didn't. Uh, the decipher was not any more specific than that. I'm considering uh, doing some. Uh, some uh, uh, gene al analysis. Uh, I think Dr. Uh, uh, Myers and Dr. Moyad have suggested that with uh, Gar uh, Garden 360 in California, um, and uh, so um, th that may tell me more how you know what, what, what my cancer is and what my mutations are, and I can be cured certain ways or immunotherapy or so on. So. 
A couple of things on that score. We, I mean, Gardens is great. We, we happen to like Foundation Medicine a lot here, which is another uh, provider um, that's actually based in Cambridge, Mass., um, who we think are very good. Um, I will put their name in the um, I'll put their name in the chat box for you momentarily. Um, but. Uh, there are a couple of issues there. I think the, the, the reason for you to get tested is not so much for um, mutation. Well, I don't want to say mutations. It's really to see what the genetic component is because you have such a strong family history, you know, with your father and your grandfather. And, right. and so the type of testing that Garden does and Foundation Medicine does is really an analysis of the tumor. And you don't have anything to analyze except for your sample back in uh, 2011. And whilst in your case, that probably doesn't make a lot of difference because it hasn't changed that much, um, my feeling if it were me, is that I would probably want to get more of a, um, a gene testing, a, a, a germline testing, I should say, to see if I'm carrying any hereditary genes. And Peter, do you, do you want to talk to that issue since that's something that you've done? Yeah, I, I did it because I had two sons uh, who were in their 40s, and I just wanted to see what I was passing on because I had a, a family background as well. Uh, and lo and behold, uh, what came back told me uh, it wasn't necessarily passing on prostate cancer, but I had a mutation in a gene that gave me a proclivity to, uh, to colorectal cancer and, uh, and stomach cancer and, and uh, cancer along that line which gave me a heads up. They told me, you know, now I officially have Lynch syndrome and I need to get a, a, a colonoscopy every year instead of every 10 years. So, but it, so it was a good thing in retrospect. It, it gave me a heads up on something that I can I can be proactive with. Mm -hmm. uh, so you, you never know what a, what a germline test is going to turn up. <laughs> so it's, it's, it's probably, I think there'll be more and more of that in, in the uh, in the days to come, it'll probably become standard procedure before too long. Mm. Um, I, what was the name of the, do you remember what the name of the people were that did your test? Uh, Ambry, A-M-B-R-Y. I, I had done at UCSF with a, uh, with a uh, saliva test. Right. Um, I think, yeah, I can't remember where they are. I can't remember where Ember is located. Yeah, so this is just simply a saliva test. But, um, Professor Bill, you know, I mean, I, I think you might have missed the beginning of, of, of Joel's um, history, but he has recurrent prostate cancer at a low level, 0.2. He had surgery six years ago, but he has a strong family history. What... Um, what are your thoughts on what type of testing he should go after? Uh, so, I had um, I had uh, the, the my test was done by Ambry, uh, similar to Peter's. I I think that I would. Um, I'm trying to remember. I, I'm not sure that Foundation One does. Um, sequencing of uh, germline they don't. DNA. They don't. They don't. Yeah. They do so if you're looking for information about relevant to family history, they're not the ones to go to. But Ambry does. And they have a pretty comprehensive panel. Um, at the time that I was tested uh, two or three years ago, they uh, sequenced about uh, 30 genes, and I think it's uh, quite a few more than that now. So I think that um, Ambry would be a good way to go. Yeah, John. Okay, appreciate that. Also, another point uh, that I failed to mention is my mother died of ovarian cancer. And I think that's the same BRCA2 gene uh, that, uh, that is, makes it uh, similar to prostate cancer. 
Um, somebody may know more about that than I do. Oh boy, do I know more about that. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, so that's what I have a, a BRCA2 mutation and an extensive family history of um, ovarian and breast cancer on my mother's side. So almost certainly I inherited this mutation from my mother. Um, so yeah, if you if your mother died of ovarian cancer and uh, you have a history of prostate cancer as well in the family, then um, Certainly, uh, BRCA mutation is a possibility, and the Embry test will tell you whether or not that's the case. And that will, you know, it, it could be uh, make a huge difference. I'm, I don't remember if you've been on this call in the past when I've talked about my own case, but I'm being treated with a drug that specifically targets the uh, BRCA2 mutation that I have, and it's been phenomenally successful. And so if you happen to have a BRCA2 mutation, then that would make you a candidate for treatment with this drug as well, or this type of drug in general. What's, what's the drug's name? The drug I'm taking is called the Laparib. The, oh, yes. Uh, the, uh, the, uh, uh, the commercial name is Limparza. Yeah, but there are other. Uh, it's, it, actually, none of these drugs are have been approved for treatment of prostate cancer. Olaparib has been approved for treatment of ovarian cancer. Um, but you can get a hold of them either through uh, clinical trials or, uh, you know, w with the help of a persistent oncologist who's willing to write to your insurance company to make arrangements for, um, you know, to be treated with it. It's, a, it's extraordinarily expensive. I just got my monthly bill, and it's uh, $13,000 per month. Um, but there are, uh, there are newer generation inhibitors in the same class that are potentially even more effective than a laparib. So, you know, these are all the sorts of things that you, know, you would be talking to your oncologist about should you test positive. There are other mutations that, you know, uh, would certainly be informative um, when they occur in your germline that, that might help in your treatment. I mean, it, I don't, I, since I didn't hear the beginning of your uh, discussion of, of, you know, w what your situation is, it seems like it, um, you know, in many cases, it's if you have high-grade cancer and it's metastatic, then um, it would be uh, a good idea to think about testing by foundation one of the DNA in your tumor if there's enough of it to be accessible. Or they also do uh, what are called liquid biopsies where they isolate tumor cells from your blood. And um, and you know and and sequence them and they can tell you whether or not right. Joe is not metastatic as far as he knows. His cancer has just recurred, so there's no sign of metastasis at this point. Okay, so I'm not sure if that. Uh, I think then it's less likely that there would be enough uh, tumor cells in your blood to be able to do a liquid biopsy, but. Um, yeah, you, you're probably not a candidate for Foundation One, but it's something, don't take my word for it. You know, I, I would uh, ask your doctor about it, and uh, who's probably not going to know very much about it, and if he doesn't, then um, then I would get in touch with Foundation One. If you Google them, you'll be able to find them easily, and they're uh, easy to talk to on the phone, and they have lots of information on their website about, you know, lots of different things, but including who would be good candidates for their type of sequencing. So that, you know, the difference is the Embry test that Peter had and I had is specific for germline mutations. So that will tell you about, you know, give, give you information relevant to your family history. But then uh, Foundation One, and there are lots of other companies that now do this too, will be looking for 
mutations in your tumor cells. So these are not germline mutations, but somatic cell mutations. And uh, that would also provide information about uh, that would be useful for figuring out how to treat you. Right, right. I think. Uh, go ahead, Joe. No, that's it. I was just uh, uh, appreciating what he was telling me. Yeah, I mean, I, I think that uh, you are probably a much better candidate. I mean, we can't give you, as you know, you're, you're a group leader, so you know this. We can't give you medical advice, but from what you're saying, I'd be discussing a germline test with your medical team rather than a somatic test of the of um, of any prostate cancer that is in your body, because it's probably the it's probably the inherited component that is more likely to show up at this stage of your disease, given the family history of prostate cancer and ovarian cancer. Yeah, I didn't mean to imply that it was an either or decision here. You very definitely, with the history that you described. At a minimum, you should have germline testing. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Okay, I appreciate that. Uh, we also have, um, I'm familiar with Oliferib and uh, Lynn Parza as uh, one of our guys in the group that goes to NIH regularly for a uh, clinical trial uh, on Oliferib. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, so, you know, if you, it turns out you have a uh, BRCA mutation in either, there are two BRCA genes, BRCA2 and BRCA1, and right. if it turns out you have a germline mutation in either of those genes, then, um, you know, you could talk to your, your friend at these group meetings, too, and, right. uh, you know, I'm sure that he, he would know quite a bit. Right. Very good. All very good advice. Thank you. A pleasure. Okay, well, let's, um, we've got a this is, a, this is a pleasure. We've got a small group tonight. How how nice. And I see Richard has joined us. Are you are you there, Richard? Yes, I am. Okay. Hello, hello. Um, so I am I'm going to just run down. Um, well, actually, what I'm going to do first is I'm just going to take a minute because I just want to fill you in on really interesting situation that happened this week. I thought we might be talking about it tonight, but the gentleman who um, got this diagnosis hasn't joined us. He does join us frequently, but he hasn't joined us tonight. But I just think it's worth mentioning, and I'm sure that we'll talk about it more. But for the benefit of those of you who are on the call, um, I got a call from, um, I'm going to say who it is because I know that A, he wouldn't mind and I and some of you may even want to reach out to him, but I got a call from Jim Cameron. Jim lives in Venice, Florida and also in Jersey and you probably remember that Jim has had a lot of issues with melanoma and he went through hyperbaric treatment to treat some bladder damage. Um, uh, he's had strictures, he's had all kinds of issues, especially recently. And, and in the course of the most recent stricture surgery that he had, his doctor found um, some peculiarities in the prostate. Jim originally had had radiation back in 2006 at Memorial Sloan Kettering. And the doctor who found it was his urologist down in Venice, Florida, who he was seeing. He also sees, um, he also goes to, to, to Johns Hopkins. I'm not going to say who his doctor is right there, at least not for the time being, because, because I don't think he did a, a really good job for, on, 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 uh, on Jim's behalf. So the, the, they, they did an MRI, and then what they found down in Florida, and what they found was a tumor on the prostate. Now, they would noticed some sort of a growth on the prostate about seven or eight months ago, and so back in March. So 
this was really somewhat of a follow-up, and the tumor had grown to a more significant size, so they biopsied it, and they sent the biopsy off, as far as I can gather, to the University of Michigan. And Michigan came back, and, and this is where I kind of came in, because Jim called me that day. I was driving back from San Diego to southern Arizona, and he said to me, I've got something called spindle cell prostate cancer. He said, have you ever heard of it? I said, no, I've never heard of spindle cell. So he said, well, they say it's very rare and that it's, you know, very lethal and da 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 da, -da. So I got home and I started looking up myself and indeed it is a very unusual diagnosis. It's most likely a secondary diagnosis, meaning that um, it arose from the first cancer and may have been, um, it may have arisen from the original radiation of the prostate. The cells have a peculiar shape, that's why it's called spindle cell, they're kind of long and thin. And it can come in two varieties from what I can gather, and this is where I sort of get a little bit above my pay grade, but Professor Bill can probably help us out with this. It can either be a carcinoma, which means it is epithelial or on the surf, arising from the surface of the cell, or it can be non-epithelial, which is a sarcoma, which means it comes from within the deep within the cell. In Jim's case, they seem to think it was a carcinoma, and they seem to think that the origin was prostate cancer. He also had two liver spots and those are getting biopsied on Thursday and we're going to try and figure out if those have anything to do with the prostate cancer or they do not or to the spindle cell and um, the treatment is probably some form of chemotherapy probably with carboplatin docetaxel and carboplatin the outlook isn't great. I don't really want to get into that, but um, only about 20% 20, 20 of men are lost in the first 12 months. Now, what bothered both me and, 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 and Jim more than anything else was that his medical oncologist at Hopkins was completely indifferent. He sort of responded by saying, well, it's a very rare cancer. It's usually treated by chemotherapy. I'll have a chat with some of my colleagues to find out what sort of chemotherapy. And literally, that was the nature. And Jim wrote back to me, and he was very disappointed. The guy had been on vacation, and that's how he answered him yesterday morning. Um, and Jim was ready to hop on a flight, get up to Johns Hopkins, although his wife also had surgery last week, so he's got some issues there too. And um, needless to say, I was miffed. And um, what we did pretty quickly is I gave him a couple of names. I reached out to both those doc to a doctor at Duke and a doctor at MD Anderson, because Jim is down in Venice, Florida. And um, the doc at MD Anderson responded literally immediately. Um, he's treating at least two of our guys right now, and I know him from having treated some other of our guys. And what we've done now is set up, set Jim up with, with this doctor, Paul Korn, who is just terrific, very empathetic very interested. I mean, this is one of the things that gets me and gets Jim. You'd think that with a very rare cancer, there's an opportunity to put your name on the map if you can figure out what to do with it, especially in this day and age where we've got all these immune therapies. Maybe we can find a, a, a way to treat this cancer. And I think that Dr. Korn has risen to that challenge. So you know, we'll keep you posted. You'll hear from Jim. Um, the first step before we even know where to go is to try and figure out whether the liver spots are the same as the prostate spots because Korn has a very interesting suggestion. He says, look, if this is still localized, meaning it's still the spindle cell is in and around the prostate only, 
then maybe the best way to treat the spindle cell is just to do a salvage prostatectomy. <laughs> Possibly the spindle cell cancer has not spread. That's if the liver spots show some other type of cancer or they're not cancerous. They may not even be cancerous. Or they may be something else because, as we know, Jim suffered from melanomas and, and other cancers. So anyway, I, I really thought it would be worth raising um, just this issue and at least letting you know that you know, prostate cancer is a very strange disease and there are many, many, many different types. Most are treatable, some are not so treatable. The, 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 the non-treatable that we hear about most often are the neuroendocrine prostate cancers and some of the small cell prostate cancers and some of the ductal prostate cancers. But spindle cell was a new one on me, um, so I wanted just to share it with you. Um, Professor Bill, how was my biology, and did I did I get the carcinoma and the sarcoma right? And 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 um, what do we need to know about carcinomas and sarcomas? Um, well, I think uh, you probably got a C plus in the biology. Okay. Okay. <laughs> the the uh, so it's it's not uh, the difference isn't between carcinoma and sarcoma isn't whether or not it develops within the cell or on the outside of the cell, but within the tissue or on the outside of the tissue. And um, in the case of these types of tumors, the uh, the sarcomas develop within the the prostate bed. In the, so sarcomas are, are are derived from muscle tissue. Uh, rather than glandular tissue like a typical uh, adenocarcinoma of the prostate. And so um, if it's a sarcoma, then it arose from, you know, the tissue surrounding the prostate. And if it's a uh, spindle cell carcinoma, then it arose from within the um, it, within the tumor itself, not in the the area around it. But in any case, it really, you know, doesn't make any much difference. They're both uh, very rare, extremely rare. So it's not something that most of us, you know, would need to worry about. It's uh, what I, so I did um, some searching in the medical literature after I got your email earlier today. And um, as of 2007, there were only 100 reported cases of these types of cancer in the literature. Wow. Um, it's extraordinarily rare. Um, but um, they are both very aggressive. Uh, and uh, unfortunately, the, the prognosis is generally quite poor. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, but the, you know, I think it's, I, it's really good that you got uh, steer Jim toward someone who knows more than his current oncologist does. Um, where is this Dr. Korn again at MD Anderson? Yeah, MD Anderson. Yeah, yeah. so that's, that's perfect. They'll, you know, he'll, he'll get good treatment there, I'm pretty sure. Yeah. Okay. So you had a pretty, well, that was just for the biology. You get a C plus. The rest of it. Okay, can, well, that's fine. I wasn't sure I was that good. So, wait a minute. Which one is the epithelial? Is that the one on the tissue, or is that the one inside? That's the one inside. Okay. That's uh, that's the sarcoma. Sarcoma is is from uh, muscle tissue. Okay. Okay. All right, gents. So there'll be a quiz next week if you come back. <laughs> none of you. None of you will be here next Monday. I don't know, Jake. You better be. You be, You better be on your game next Monday, Jake. Um, I have an appointment. Oh, okay. <laughs> so, is there any um, anybody that would like to ask any questions? Discuss. Not that we can answer anything, but is there anybody that has any anything they would like to raise before I go around everybody and see who'd like to talk today on this? That's on this uh, spindle cell issue. Okay. Okay. So let me let me run down the list and let's see uh, let's see who needs to talk. And 
if you've got something that's been on your mind for a while, tonight's the night because we don't have a lot of people and you can, you can, you've got plenty of time. Jake, anything for you? Uh, no, Rick, not tonight. Okay. Um, Jay Crockman, would you like some time tonight? Uh, just an update. I had a doctor's appointment uh, middle of last week. Okay, we'll come back to you. Um, looks like Paul Frieda is left. No, yes, Paul Frieda's left. Yeah, yeah I'm here. Oh, you're there. Okay. Yeah, yeah I'm here. Well, my, my internet has been going out occasionally, so uh, but I got back. Uh, yeah, I have a little thing to, to talk about. Um, a little slight change in my my situation. Okay, you got it. We'll we'll we'll, we'll come back to you, um, Peter. Anything for you? Peter? Well, he must have gone to get a cup of coffee. Peter, are you still, are you still with us? Yes, I am. I had it on mute. Okay. Yes, I'd like to bring something up uh, in regards to a friend of mine in the Napa Valley area. With pleasure. Post radiation. I'd like. I think I brought it up once before, a yeah. number of months ago, but I'd like to consider it again. Absolutely, with pleasure. Um, Bill, anything for you? Yeah, if we have the time, I'll give you a brief update. We have the time. And Richard, anything for you? Uh, nothing for me. I'm. We're waiting for the. Uh, I'll be doing scans at the end of this week, and uh, so maybe next time. I'll have some something to talk about, but nothing now. Okay. Um, okay. Jay, you're up. Start us off. There you go. Jay, are you with us? Are you on Jay or Jake? Jay. You. Jay. Okay, I'm sorry. You got it. I'm sorry. Got it off. Um, just to update, um, I had a doctor's appointment with my urologist last Wednesday. Um, that was after my three-month uh, PSA test, which came back at a 0.2, which was up from a 0 0.06 previously. Mm -hmm. So it had a little more than tripled in, in three months. Um, he was not overly concerned at, about that at this point in time. He wanted to push. He wanted to go out six weeks for a uh, another blood test. I told him I'd be much more comfortable at four weeks, um, but I didn't have an issue with four weeks at that point either. Um, asked him about next steps if it continues to rise and when I need to uh, get handed off or start consulting with an oncologist. And he thought it was uh, too early at this point in time. So, not sure if I agree with that or not. Um, I'll just uh, throw that out there, and and we talked about um, Alicia Morgan's at Vanderbilt, who has gone up to Chicago, right? Um, and um, kind of looking around, I'm not getting a whole lot of, believe it or not, from the from the internet and reviews and everything else, not finding a whole lot of confidence in any of the oncologists here in the Memphis area. Yeah. But uh, I have not talked directly with any of them yet either. So that's kind of where I'm at right now. I'm kind of looking for. For ideas, and uh, if I do need to start with an oncologist, uh, if anyone knows one or uh, has any suggestions how to vet one out. Well, we 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 certainly know plenty. The question is, um, the geographical location. That, that's really um, that's really the issue. Um, you know, I don't know anybody now at Vanderbilt, um, but it just seems unusual to me that uh, that there's nobody come in to replace um, Alicia Morgan. Morgan's. I will say that I would not suggest. And this is, if it were me, I definitely would not be seeing Kevin Moses there. He is a He's a urological oncologist. He's a surgeon, and 
he likes to treat advanced disease at Vanderbilt, but I have not been impressed. I've heard him speak twice now on Zero's webinars, and I haven't been particularly impressed with him. So if it were me, he would not be my choice. At the same time, one would hope that there is a, a Genito urinary medical oncologist um, who is uh, who's somewhere around there. Now, I recently found, we recently found a guy that looks pretty good in Atlanta, um, but that's a little far away. There's definitely some good options in Chicago. You know, that's, that's not that close. Um, I, I, I don't have any names for you in St. Louis, but my guess is that there's probably somebody at Washington who's good. Um, so, um, let me, I, I don't know. I mean, you, the trouble is, who do we, can we find anybody in Tennessee for you? I'm not sure. Okay. Um, I do have an, another, you know, uh, four-week check on PSA, and then I do have a, uh, an event I need to go to in Chicago. And so my family, I'm from, from that area, so I have family up there and everything else. So staying up there is not inconvenient at all. Okay. Um, so I may try and get a, an appointment with Alicia if she's uh, taking anything, just to touch base with her and see if she'll do it on a uh, consultation basis as well or, right. or something like that. So, I mean, th that's not a bad idea. I mean, the, there, there are, first of all, I don't know when she's starting. So I think it was you that told me that she wasn't starting work until November. Se no, it's September 1. Oh, September 1. So yes. I think Alicia Morgan is a really good op really good one, but I'd like to suggest somebody else to you if you're going to consider Chicago because he's really good and people that we've referred to him in the past have come back and said thank you. That was a wonderful referral. And I, I don't know anybody that Alicia's act, Alicia Morgans has actually treated, but I've just heard her speak and I know Jim Marshall likes her. The guy that I want to refer, want to mention to you is Walter Stadler. At, um, at University of Chicago Hospital. And um, I'll put, I'm just putting his name in, um, in the chat window and I'll put a link in a second. I'll put a link to, um, whoops, that went to Betty. That should have gone to everybody. Sorry about that. Uh, I'm just, uh, I'm just putting it, giving it to you again, paste. Whoa, based, oh, and also I put Stradler, and I should have put Stadler, and everyone, and there you go. So, uh, and I'll give you, I've got a link to his profile, I'll put that in the chat window in a second. Um, he's really good, empathetic, compassionate, very smart, um, people seem to, you know, they like him. So that's an alternative. Now, the other name at Northwestern is um, Maha Hussein, um, who is really um, a bit of a legend. She used to be um, chief of uh, medical oncology at University of Michigan, Ann Arbor. And she, she moved um, last year, I think, or two years ago, and she's now there. And she is also a very, very well-recognized Janito urinary medical oncologist. So you really have three choices that, that, that are very well qualified in Chicago. Alicia Morgan's okay. Maha Hussein at Northwestern. I didn't put Northwestern, but, but I think you know that. And um, let, me, let, me give you these, uh, let me give you these bookmarks for, um, first of all, for, uh, first of all, for Walter Stadler. Um, I don't know. Did, oh, wait a minute. I've come across. I came across. Uh, I came across Maha Hussein first. So you'll get that one first. Anybody else have any suggestions? I mean, the, the, I guess there is one other thing I want to say, which is, you know, I, I would be leery of the medical uncle of your urologist. I mean, it's not too early. You you've been through enough treatment already, and you know, a lot of times these guys want to hang on to the Lupron shots. At the same time. You're probably going to see him for your Lupron shots anyway. So, you know. Well, I, 
I did have an uh, interesting conversation with his nurse before he came in and um, kind of going over what I was doing. And I just asked her what, what she thought. And she was, you need to go back on a you know, hormone treatment. So I said, well, that's all well and good. And said, I'm thinking about an oncologist. And she got really quiet and <laughs> said, well, this doctor, the one I'm seeing, does not, um, he likes to follow the procedure. Um, we try this one and then when that fails, then we go to the next one and not treating a lot of it all at once. Like it sounds like, you know, with the, um, chemo and hormone treatment or, or your um, other, other type of treatments. So it was interesting that she said he sounded very old school in, uh, in regards to the treatment process. Well, you know, it isn't so much the sequential, because I, I don't think there's anything wrong with treating the disease sequentially. But the, the problem, to my mind, is that um, urologists are not qualified to treat men that are getting any form of systemic treatment. Because systemic treatment involves internal medicine. And these guys are trained in surgery. They're not trained in internal medicine. So when you have side effects and issues and problems that arise from the treatment that you've been prescribed, and those side effects are impacting different organs and functions in your body, a surgeon just isn't expected to know about that. And a lot of times they just don't. And the tradition in, 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 in prostate cancer has been that the urologists hold on to treatment. And they really should not. They need to give their patients up earlier. And it sounds like you've got one of these guys who wants to hold on to his treatment. Now, being totally cynical, anybody that's on hormone therapy is a cash cow. Because every three months or so, they get another Lupron shot. And they bill, you know, they, that, that bills very generously and they make money. So a lot of these guys, if they're not in a, um, if they're not in a, a academic or, um, or government practice like the VA, they don't want to lose you. Because you walk away, they lose four grand a year just from billing you, just from billing you on the Lucron shop. And sadly, that's a problem. And so um, my, if it were me, and we said this to you when you first came on here, get a medical oncologist involved in your treatment. Doesn't mean to say they have to be the prescribing doctor if they are too far away, but combine them with a local oncologist. This is one of the things I was, we were talk, I was talking with Jim, Jim Cameron about and Paul Korn. Paul Korn's more than happy to do it. He says, Find a good local oncologist, and I'll work with him. And sometimes we have to do that only because we don't have enough genito urinary medical oncologists around. It's a fairly uncommon specialty. And sadly, the general practice medical oncologists don't specialize, rarely specialize in prostate cancer. And there's so much going on in prostate cancer that you need one of these guys that has the knowledge on your team either as the quarterback or as a contributing, as a contributing player. Any, anyone else want to kick in on that? No, other than that, I, I agree with your take on things. Thanks. This is Bill Williams. Good enough. Thank you. So, okay. Well, let, let's keep moving along. Um, and Paul Frieda, you're up. Oh, but it's okay. one, just one last thing. I put both those links in the windows for you, Jay. I got them. Thank you. Okay. Go ahead. Okay, me, Paul Frieda. Yes, sir. Oh, okay. Um, let's see. The um, I have a minor change in my condition in that um, you know I've had incontinence since my uh, prostate surgery in 2014. And now it's starting to get, um, starting to increase. And um, I'm almost at a point now where I have to change, uh, you know, I change the pad every morning when I take a shower. Uh, or I put a new pad in with a new piece of underwear. 
And um, I'm almost at a point now where I'm in the middle of the day, I'm going to have to start changing it again. Uh, and uh, that's going to be a real nuisance. But what I haven't tried yet and which I need to do is, um, is uh, instead of waiting until I feel that I need to urinate, I, I should just go every two hours. And I think maybe that will give me, um, you know, maybe another six months or something like that before it gets, gets worse. I was wondering if anybody had any similar situation or any comments about that? Ew. <laughs> oh boy. Um, I, I don't, uh, so I've been, my, my situation is really crazy. I mean, I go uh, for several days in a row where I need pads and uh, because I can't pass any urine at all. Um, sorry, because I can't stop it from coming. And then, uh, you know, for another week after that, I, I can't pass anything and I have to catheterize. Um, wow. Yeah. So, um, but it's, it sounds like a good plan. I mean, I, I, I have no control. So I'm not sure that it would work for me, but... Um, you know, well, how, often do you, how often do you change pads? I change pads about every two to three hours. Oh my goodness! Oh, I, I thought I thought I was in trouble. Oh wow, that's uh, that must be a real nuisance. I mean, you no, have to leave it, meetings it, in the middle or something like that, or I mean, it's it's not too bad. I mean, I certainly wish I didn't have to, but I just um, you know, whenever I go anywhere, I have a small knapsack and I carry um, supplies in it, including pads, and uh, you know, a couple of uh, of plastic grocery bags to put the used ones in if I have to change in a public restroom. Right, I right. I don't want to walk out of the stall carrying the pad, but um, it's a lot more convenient than diapers, which I also use. I generally use them at night because they have a higher capacity. Um, uh -huh. you know, but the the you know the pads just are they're easy to remove and replace and it's it's really not that bad of an experience. Okay, diapers at night. I'll remember that. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. I think the capacity is there. Well, I don't know if it's the capacity is larger. For some reason, they're just less likely to leak, and yeah. um, and if you're not careful, they will leak. You know the the pads or the diapers if you don't change them uh, frequently enough. You know I already bought um, you know um, waterproof uh, covering for my mattress, so if I do leak, I don't ruin my mattress. You know. Yeah, I I uh, buy uh, under pads for that purpose. You know that um, you know uh, they're variously called chucks. I think in the hospital they're just Called chuck, uh, called what? They're called chucks, I think, in a lot of places. They're just, a, uh, they have a waterproof backing. They're, they're, you know, different sizes, but the ones I get are maybe 20 inches by 33 inches, I think. Okay. And they have a absorbent surface, and under that it, it's uh, waterproof, and so I just spread it out on the bed underneath me. Um, How often do you change them? Um... If I haven't leaked, I just routinely change them once a week. Okay. I, you know, when I leak, I, of course, change them right away. And oh. um, you can buy them, uh, uh, <laughs> you can buy them really expen inexpensively if you buy them as uh, pads for training dogs at a pet store, <laughs> I've learned. <laughs> well, <laughs> they're a lot less okay. expensive. So you can keep that in mind. Um, okay. You you also uh, might keep in mind that um, these things are um, should I say they're covered by insurance? They're not. Um, I'm trying to think of what the situation is for us. I get a, a prescription for pads and diapers from an uh, oncologist. Oh, really? Okay. Yeah. And, you know, so for however many every month, 
and um, that makes it possible to recover the cost through um, from a uh, a, a uh, what are the plans called where you put set money aside um, oh, right. And, right medical and, medical savings account yeah thank you yeah I'm blanking on it so that reduces the cost somewhat you know it becomes uh, you don't have to pay tax on it okay uh, uh, so that's something else to keep in mind but it's really it's not it's that not it really isn't that much of a problem and I travel quite a bit you know including overseas and so you know it's uh, it makes it possible to do that where otherwise I wouldn't be able to yeah, well you can buy pad you can buy has pretty much any any CVS or Wal Walgreens, right? Yeah, that's correct. Yeah, right. and they they come in different as you probably already know. They come in different absorbencies. I get the right, maximum yeah, different lengths and different capacities. Yeah, right. Right. Yeah, right. Yeah. Peter, All right. Well, thank you, thank you for that information. Sure. Peter, would you like to chime in on this too? Yeah, I guess Paul is. My question is. is is it stress incontinence or is it just plain involuntary? I mean, is it does it happen mostly when you cough, sneeze, or laugh, and so forth? No, no, when that's lose control. Or is... No, well, no, I've had I've had the stress part. You know, if I well, sometimes get up out of the chair, I can feel it squirt a little bit. But now it's getting to a point where I'm just not doing anything, and all of a sudden uh, I look down and I go, "What the What the hell are you doing?" You know, it's coming out. You know, and. Uh, so it yeah. seems to be get coming out much more easily now, and I'm, um, you know, I'm, I, I don't know how fast it's going to, uh, you know, increase, but I can see there's a change coming. Uh, I sort of saw it a little bit about three, four months ago, and then I sort of uh, ignored it. But now I've been getting up in the morning, and uh, the pad is really soaked, and um, and, and it, you know, so it's. Um, yeah, so, so I'm, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm entering a new phase of controlling the incontinence, you know. Is this post-surgery or post-radiation? I never had radiation. It was post-surgery, and it didn't come on, I think, for, I didn't think I had any incontinence for almost a year after surgery, and then, then all of a sudden I, I, I started to, you know, have to do something about it. So, um, yeah, so... I think I, I would uh, just add, you know, that um, I, I highly recommend the underpads because if you do leak, as as uh, you know, things get worse, you're more likely to leak. And um, if you have an underpad lying over your sheets, then you know you just throw the the underpad away. Where if you know you, uh, you know, the the rubber lining underneath the sheet will protect your mattress but you have to go through the trouble of replacing the sheet in the middle of the night which is a pretty big right. hassle. So, right. I would, so I would definitely think about getting these under pads. Under pads, yeah. Uh, where do you get them? At any CVS, uh, Rite Aid, any you know grocery stores sell them. Okay, and, you can get under pads. And, All right. Well, you said it's something like 20 inches by 33 inches. They come in different sizes, but yeah, I think though that's the size that I use. Is there a, a name, you know, um, uh, the name of the manufacturer or a generic name? Um, if you give me a, a minute, I'll find out. But uh, I'll, 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 I can put my email in as in the chat board. And yeah. Just, okay. Yeah. Okay. That's fine. I'll yep. Put my email in the chat board. You can just at your leisure send me an yeah. email. Yeah, good. But, you idea. know, I, I've been, you know, the grocery stores, and I look at all the different kinds of pads. You know, there's a whole lot for women, and then, uh, but I, I don't remember ever seeing anything like an underpad before. So. Yeah, actually, it's. I, I mean, I bought them at really big grocery stores, but there are a lot of medium size and smaller grocery stores that don't have them. And once again, I've learned okay. this from traveling a lot, and you know. And, well, you know, I live in a retirement area, so I would think that they should have them. You know. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, but also, you know, don't forget the pet store supply. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah. I, I I made note of that. Yeah. So, um, one thing I think, if I were in your shoes, I might want to do, Paul, is to have a chat with you with a urologist because what's interesting in your case is that 
you weren't incontinent for the first year. So it isn't like you couldn't, your, your urethra, the reconnection with urethra, your urethra and the use of your single um, valve was hard to, to manage. Um, you mean you got on top of that. So whatever's happening, I wonder whether it's related to the prostate cancer or it may be related to something quite different. And there are some medical and surgical treatments. For example, a sling is a possibility. Um, and, you know, beyond that, uh, we, we have men on here that um, I, I think of at least two off the top of my head, and I would be happy to connect them to, to you, who have had artificial sphincters, and that's totally solved their problem. So, you know, it's not something that you necessarily have to live with. Bill and I have talked about this. Bill has been through so much surgery that, you know, it might not be something he wants to do now, but it is a very viable option. And my recommendation to you would be to go review your history with a urologist and talk to them about the, the various options that might be available to you. Have you, have you done that yet? Oh, no, not at all. Is a, a sling the same thing as an artificial sphincter? No. 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 Those are two different, two different things. Okay. Peter, go ahead. And yeah, this, yeah I, had sling, I had the sling surgery done in conjunction with my prostatectomy. It was done at the same time. And uh, I, I came out of surgery continent, and I still have. Uh, I went back to my surgeon, who's world-class surgeon at UCSF, and I thanked him. I said, "You know, gosh, I'm, you know, after 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 seven months of uh, of being on catheters, you know, I was just thankful to come out able to urinate again, and not only got decontinent." And I I mentioned to him that that was it the sling that made the difference, and he kind of he kind of joked and said, "No, it's actually the surgeon that makes the difference." Uh, so I don't, I don't know, but I would think, you know, why, why don't they do sling surgery as a matter of course if it can be done in conjunction with a prostatectomy? I mean, it just it holds up and supports the urethra. Uh, Peter, so it's not hanging there. Peter, uh, I miss yes. absolutely everything that you said. I, I, my internet dropped out. I apologize. I said, Okay, I said I had sling surgery in conjunction with my prostatectomy several years ago. That was it, the last, um, last thing I heard, yeah. Yeah, and that's when I went back to my urologist to perform the surgery, who's a world-class surgeon, I said it must be, the, I told him it must be the sling surgery that made me come out continent. And he kind of he laughed and said, actually, it's probably more the surgeon. So I don't know, but uh, but I wonder why they don't do sling surgery as a matter of course with a prostatectomy if it's so easy, because it takes some of the pressure off the urethra just hanging there from the bladder that uh, supports it quite a bit. Uh huh. Yeah. Well, I well my you know I you know sometimes we have these impressions about things because we really don't know. I got the impression that sling surgery is like you know kind of not, not something you want to do unless you have to do it. You, you make it, you make it, sound like, you make it sound like it's a, you know, an appendectomy. It's very routine. Well, they did it the same time they removed my prostate. I didn't know any, I, I didn't ask for it. It just, I got the report and it said it was done at the same time. Well, uh, I, I hope the surgeon was, a you know, had a lot of integrity and felt that there was no question that you would not turn it down. Right. I, I think he was, he was looking after me because I was, had urinary retention for so long and had urinary problems. I think he was doing everything he could for me. Uh, I see. And it worked. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. But I think, yeah. I think the take home message here, Paul, is that not to try and handle it alone with just ways to um, ways ways to protect yourself from the incontinence 
but to talk to a doctor because there, there may be some medical solutions here and it could be a medical problem and, you know, maybe that's the way to go. Do you, do okay, you... no, that's a very, very good suggestion, Rick. I'm going to make an appointment with, uh, with the urologist that I, that I had. It turned out when I moved back to, to Florida a couple of years ago, two years ago, uh, I was able to find the same doctor that first diagnosed me with, um, with a large prostate back in uh, okay. the year 2000, right. 15 years ago, right. and um, and he he remembered me and I remembered him. Yeah, right. so I'll go I'll go back and see him, Dr. Singer. Yeah, yeah, go back and see him, um, and tell us how you do, and you know maybe we can have a different and a happier ending to this, and you know you'll be like Peter, where the issue um, can be resolved permanently without having to worry about pads, etc. Yeah. Okay. I'm. I'm gonna. I'm gonna check out and get some professional help. That's what probably should do that before it gets out of hand. That's, um, that's a good idea. Go ahead. I have one, one other. One other issue I'd like to raise, and that is that. Um, you know, I'm approaching my two-year point on Lupron, and I'm a Gleason eight, and so you know, I, you know, I can't expect to be get five or six years out of the Lupron. If I do, I'm. I would consider myself unbelievably lucky, but um, and get preparation for the next stage. Uh, there are apparently two things that I probably should be doing, and that is the ARV7 test, which would, as I understand it, um, give you an idea how abiraterone and, uh, and, and, and Xtandi will work or not work. And uh, when I approached my uh, 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 GU uh, oncologist, they said, oh, we don't do that here. And, um, and then the other thing is I probably should be looking into genetic testing and see if I'm a candidate there. Um, so uh, is there a, a company I can call and they can just tell me what to do? And Okay. Uh, so let, let's, or, or, or do I have to find them. another GU on, oncologist? Let, let's take them one by one. Um, right now, I still don't think that there is a commercially available ARV7 test, but um, Johns Hopkins test is available to the public and any doctor can order the Johns Hopkins test, any doctor. And I am going to put in your, in the chat window, the, um, as soon as I can find it, I'm going to put in the, in the chat window, the test. Um, Let's just see, where is it? Uh, ARV7 positive status, ARV7. I've got to find it. I'll, 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 um, I'll, I'll, I'll find it and I'll put in the chat window the, the, the forms to order the test. So then you go back to your doc and you say, doc, here's the forms. I'd like the test, please. Here it is. I got it right now. Hold on a minute. Edit. Uh, so I'm putting the forms in the chat window for you. Okay. And if your doctor still won't do it, you need another doctor. Because that's uh, all, all everybody, I'm sending this, everybody can see this. If anybody else wants to save it for future, they can save it. But it's right there. Um, so that, that's, the, that's the first thing, okay? The second thing as to whether to do genomic testing right now, um, and oh, let, let me come back to one thing. I mean, of course, if you're, what, what was your most recent PSA? I have a PSA, uh, um, I don't have a record of a PSA for you for ages. What, what's your most recent PSA? Well, I'm, you know, I'm on Lupron, I'm, I'm undetectable. And how long have you been undetectable? For getting close to two years, when uh, when I got my first Lupron shot, I was up. It had gotten to like seven or something like that, and um, and uh, it immediately went went to undetectable, and it's been that way for you know a long time. Yeah, I had you. You're at two point five. You got higher than that. You got up to seven point oh, huh? Well, uh, I, I you know as possible, I um, I misremember, and it was two point five, but. Um, I remember before my prostate surgery, it got up to 19, right. whereas for 10 years, it was sitting at 12 and 13. 
Um, but uh, when um, after my prostate surgery, I came out at 0.22, and um, and I had read from the doc doctor. Uh, I can't remember his name. The famous doctor uh, who wrote the classic book. Whoa. What? Yeah, Dr. Walsh said if you're at above 0.2, you're all, you're probably systemic, and um, right, right, and, uh, and, and so that so I I waited until it started, you know, got right. up past one, and I think right. I don't know, I made it to two or seven or somewhere in there, but then I point, got my first shot. The 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 point though is that I have a record. I don't know when it was. I'm not sure when you went on. You must have gone on around 2015. Yes, late 2015, my first shot. Yeah, oh, here it is. I see it. 11 uh, November, November of uh, 15. So, um, you know, if you've been undetectable since 2015, to be honest, I don't think I'd even be worrying about ARV7 tests right now. What you know that even if you start to creep up, like Jay does, Jay has, or you know, it comes back a little bit. You've got plenty of time to get an ARV7 test when it comes to that. I mean, oh, do I? Why, why the pressure? Well, do my I... doubling time was pretty quick, as I remember. But it but isn't now. My doubling time was like three months. Yeah, three but, months, what? But it isn't now. Oh, you, th oh, you think? Well, I would think the, the doubling time is, um, um, uh, you know, correlates with the aggressiveness of your cancer, and that doesn't change just because you've been taking Lupron, or, or, is that, or am I wrong about that? I, I, I don't, I've never seen any studies that say that. I mean, it sounds logical, but it isn't so. Who, anyone else want to comment on whether they would get a uh, test and genomic testing and all of this at this point when they're still undetectable? Uh, so I, I wouldn't. I just try the drugs. Yeah, uh, same. This is Bill Burhans. Just mean, do the drugs. Yeah, huh? yeah. Your next step is probably going to be, you know, either Xtandy or or Avaratarone, and uh, it will be easy to get the test. You know, once your PSA starts rising, and uh, you know that will tell you that it's time to get the test, and uh, you know you'll be able to get the test done and the results obtain fairly in the in fairly quick order and then you can make a decision then but i wouldn't worry about it until then yeah. some people stay on lupron for years some people you know don't develop resistance to lupron and just go on it for years well yeah yeah i would if i were if i were at gleason six or seven i think i'd have a chance but gleason eight is sort of uh gleason eight in addition to the fact that my um you know the doubling time was uh pretty low, I, um, pretty, you know, pretty aggressive. I, I kind of feel like um, uh, that's pr I'm probably not a candidate for five years, five or six years. We don't but, want. You know, I, you know I, I like to think positive. You know, I drive into a parking lot and I create a parking space for myself, you know, so maybe I'll get lucky and get, you know, get five or six years. Yeah. Um, but the, the bottom line is, though, you know, what are you going to do with that information from the test? As long as your PSA is negligible, then you know you're, there's nothing to do with that information. So there's just no point in uh, getting it. Is my the way I would look at it. Paul, well, this is Jake. Yeah. Um, even if your PSA does start going up eventually on the Lupron, it does not mean that the Lupron's not working. Um, I've been on it for over five years, and, and mine goes up. You know, went up a little bit too, so so I'm on an enzalutamide now, but it still does its job. Um, so you can you might get many many years out of it as as others have said. So I wouldn't worry about it at this point. Yeah, I'm in the same situation. I'm going to have this conversation with my oncologist in a couple of weeks, but I'm at least in nine, and I'm on right now. I'm off of all Lupron. I'm I'm on a I'm on a holiday right now, but and my PSA is going up one hundredth of a point each month. So now it's at point five or something like point zero five. One hundredth uh, or one tenth? One hundredth. Point zero wow, five. Well, that's very slow. You know, that's a yeah, you can go, very, go, go, very go all, go all year I'm, and go up point one. Yeah, that's that's nothing. Yeah, and I'm not I'm not racing to get you know. Uh, tested for ARV7. If I can go a couple more years like this without ADT, I'd be happy about it. Yeah, okay. 
you know, the, right. one okay. of the, maybe the discussion you might want to be having since you've done so well for two years is what about intermittent therapy like Peter has done? Uh, yeah, I was going to suggest that to my doctor, but you know, I, uh, I, I, I don't know. Is, is there any risk to that? I mean, other than, you know, let's say you, you try it and after two months it starts rising again as you go back, you haven't hurt yourself in any way. I'm, I'm just afraid that, uh, you know, the little monster in there uh, will get more powerful if I, if I, you know, if I loosen up on them. Peter? I, I don't think so. I mean, that goes through my head once in a while, but I, I kind of think of it like, uh, you know, just go back on. It's like swinging a baseball bat, knock it down again. I, I don't know. <laughs> I'll, again, I'll have this conversation with my oncologist in a couple of weeks, and I'll report back and see what he says. He's, he's a pretty aggressive guy in terms of treating things aggressively. Um, he's he's, he's uh, with prostate, can prostate con oncology specialists. And he's, uh, I mean, he's he's watching out for me. He lets me know if he's if I if I'm taking too much risk. So yeah, I but trust, you, I trust yeah. that. It's also I, the case. It's also the case that aside from, you know, if you go on a periodic holiday, um, you know, you you might not have uh, some of the side effects, but um, the bigger benefit is that you're not so apt to select for mutant cells that become resistant to luprolide. And so, you know, as long as you're, you're taking Lupron or Eligard, you know, the two versions of luprolide, then you're applying selective pressure, uh, just like in evolution, for cells that have mutations that make them insensitive to that drug. And they eventually outgrow all the others. But if you occasionally go off the drug, then that's less likely to happen. So that's a, a pretty well, good argument for intermittent therapy, I think. Oh, yeah, I hadn't heard that argument. You're saying you actually get more survival by, by with intermittent uh, therapy than you might get more survival with intermittent therapy. I didn't realize yeah, that. Exactly, yeah. Oh, well, then I definitely got to talk to my oncologist about that. Yeah, I would. it, it might be worthwhile. So, okay, thank you very much. I, I appreciate that. I just put two links in the chat window for you, Paul. One came out. The other one, you may have to cut and paste it. Um, I, can't, I can't see it right now, but um, okay. did you send it just to me? or? No, I, it's in there for everybody. It's in the chat window, okay? Yeah, I can't see it. My connection this, these days is... I may have to change internet providers, but... Um, well, I, I can't help you with that one, but I can help you with a lot of... A lot of links that I have in my bookmarks about intermittent versus continuous um, therapy. I mean, the, the, as best as I remember, Maha Hussein, who we talked about earlier, did a um, a, a uh, what's the word? A, a, a very important study. Very important isn't the word I want. A, a uh, um, definitive. Sorry? Definitive? Definitive will do. Thank you, Bill. Did a definitive study on um, continuous versus intermittent that was presented at ASCO around 2012, 2013, I can't remember. And what they determined was that if a man goes on to hormone therapy after initial treatment, not as their initial treatment, not as their primary treatment, but as subsequent treatment, that intermittent is not inferior. It's non-inferior to continuous. Okay, only, I didn't know that. It's only inferior. Well, you can Google, look up Maha Hussein, Google Maha Hussein intermittent ther hormone therapy and ASCO or something. There's, I've got loads and loads of links on this. I've just put two in there. For you, one from Prostate Cancer International and one from Medscape. As you know, with Medscape, you've got to sign up, but it's free and it's it's worth signing up to Medscape because they have a lot of good articles on there. So those are a couple of really good articles. But I think that in your case, probably the research suggests that you are 
it's non-inferior to, to go on intermittent therapy. And if you can get onto intermittent therapy, certainly, as Bill says, and I 100% agree with it, it's likely to reduce the likelihood that your cancer morphs, and, and, or it's going to morph slower. And secondly, you're going to feel better. And yeah, yeah, you know, I'm, you know, feeling better is fine, but you know, I'm, I'm, I'm willing to walk through hell to, you know, to stay alive as long as I can for my daughter. You know, that's uh, right. You know, but you know, I mean, uh, I, that's see, I, I was in the impression intermittent therapy was for people who whose whose side effects were so bad they could hardly take it, and they just, you know, and they just wanted to get off it. And uh, I'm fortunate enough that my side effects are are, are not 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 a huge problem. So uh, I never ever considered intermittent, but now I will now that I have this new information. Okay. Well, I think you should do some research. You can reach out to me again. I can send you more links. I've probably got 10 links in there on intermittent versus continuous. Um, okay. And, um, but start off with what you've got and, you know, you, you, you're a good researcher, you know, how to follow through. So you'll, you'll look at some of this. Um, okay. Okay. And I'm, I'm going to, I'm going to uh, double check and make sure that the information I gave you is correct. I think that it is, but I, I'll double check and I'll get back to you on it. Okay, Bill, I checked. Did you see it? I'm sorry. I put my email address in the chat window, so you can email it to me. I don't see it. I, um, I did it too. I sent you. I sent you Paul's email address, Bill. Yeah, yeah. I've, yeah so I, I have yours already uh, uh, spliced into an email message, Paul. So. Okay. Yep. Um, now. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Okay. Yeah. Well, we get we gave you lots of homework, Paul. You bet. You bet. That's, okay. uh, um, we had someone else that joined us on the telephone. Um, or it might be somebody who's already with us who came back on the telephone. Did somebody come on the telephone just recently? I'm Sylvester Mann. I came oh, on about Hello, Sylvester. How are you? How is everybody? I'm doing fine, and I hope everybody else is doing good. Good. Anything you want to talk about tonight? Not tonight. I'm just getting in a little late. Okay. I'm sorry I'm late. That's okay. You're welcome anytime. We don't, we don't, we don't give, uh, we don't give detrimental marks, demerits. We don't give demerits for, for lateness on this call, Sylvester. I'm glad to hear that. <laughs> Good. Oh, Sylvester, are you going to be at PCRI this year? Yes, I am. I should be arriving sometime around noon Friday. Okay, well, we'll, we'll send you an invitation to our... Uh, to our reception as well. I'll make a note and send you one right afterwards. Thanks so much. Pleasure. Um, okay, so let's just keep going down my list. Peter, you're up. Okay, uh, I'm a little bit hesitant to bring this up. I did bring it up probably about a year ago, but it's, it's come up again. This is not a relationship to me, but a very good friend of mine from uh, Northern California who I met when I was going through uh, IMRT radiation at, at UCSF uh, a year and a half ago. And he, he was, it, it kind of reminds me a little bit about our first discussion with the, with the uh, I can't remember your name from Virginia, uh, who runs the US2 group there. Joe, Joe but, Manchette. Joe, yeah, Joe. Anyway, this relates to uh, what he found he had a prostatectomy years ago, and then he had follow-up radiation uh, a couple of years ago, a year and a half ago, and that's where I met him. And after the radiation, he found that he had developed hairline fractures in the base of his spine, and he had to go on crutches, and he's still on crutches. He's having a, a hell of a time, and he feels it's, a, it's related to, and he wasn't warned about it, the radiation weakened his, his spine, his bones. He's, he's on prolia now. Um, he was never on, on a hormone therapy, even with radiation. Um, and I think he's going to consult with, uh, you know, talk about uh, rare beasts. I think he's going to consult with an 
osteopathic uh, oncologist at UCSF. Uh, I've never heard of such a person, but I guess they have one to see if there's any way to strengthen his, his skeletal system or whatever, and whether indeed he, uh, the radiation did deteriorate his, uh, his spine. So I, I'm just throwing this out because I talked to him quite a bit. He's never been on our call. He's a good, good friend, though. And, uh, and my heart goes out to him. He doesn't, it's not a compression fracture. It's, it's just hairline fractures that, that uh, prohibit him from, from walking without assistance. And I guess it's more common with women than men, but it does happen. Has anybody ever had experience with this or know anything about it? And and you think this is solely from the from the radiation? He thinks it is because he didn't have this problem before. He came out of the radiation with this problem. Anyone have any thoughts? Well, I just did a quick Google on uh, radiation effects on bones, and it, I found a um, website at uh, the National Comprehensive Cancer Network that says that uh, treatments including radiation, chemotherapy, and medications may pose a risk to bone health. So, you know, it, he may be right, it sounds like. It says, uh, in going on, it says radiation may have direct toxic effects on bone, but remains a mainstay of treatment for bone metastases and local therapy um, despite this. What's, what's the status of his prostate cancer, Peter? I think it's, it's non-detectable. He's doing fine that way. He's not metastatic. He was a Gleason seven, mm -hmm. and uh, he 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 got away, he got away with about six years. So you know when Joe was speaking about you know further action at a point two, I would I would wait because any any kind of any kind of treatment can have a downside. That's that's my take home for it. I'm not I'm not sure based on what we heard from Mr. from Dr. Moyad. I don't know whether he would agree with you though right you how know, how long ago did he have radiation treatment about a year and a half ago when uh, we finished in march of uh the year before last this past and, one march of uh 15. and he's still having these problems march, march of 16 i mean oh yeah, yeah. He's, uh, he's on crutches jeepers is he doing all yeah. the obvious things you know to maintain bone health like uh tell, taking calcium supplements and vitamin d yeah he does that He's, and they give him a prolia shot every six months um but we'll see i'll, I'll report back when he he's going to meet with this uh osteopathic oncologist at ucsf and uh see if there's any anything that can be done for this yeah does he have does he have low bone density? I think yeah, I think so. I think he tends toward you know heavy osteopenia anyway. Right. But his 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 contention is that he wasn't warned about this when he went through radiation at UCSF. That, you know, that never came up and he, he tried to go back to Dr. Chang and Dr. Chang wouldn't talk to him and Anyways, it's, it's, uh, he, he's kind of bummed out. <laughs> so at some point, I'll get him to join our calls. But I, I just want I mean, you to know, throw this out because it's an odd one. You know, when I, when I was diagnosed, they did a bone scan. On, they did a bone density test on me because it should be standard before they put men on Lupron. Not everybody does it, but it should be the protocol. And they found right. I was borderline, uh, I had borderline osteoarthritis. I was like minus 2.4 in my spine. And, um, and then, and then, um, uh, Paul, could you mute, please? Thanks. Um, 
And and so I, I was borderline osteo, I had osteoarthritis, and I got a lot of radiation. Um, and I also changed my exercise pattern, and I also got um, Zometa for, I got three shots of Zometa annually, uh, right at the beginning, after the first year, and after the second year. And my um, osteo my osteoarthritis in my spine went down from eventually from minus two point four to minus one. I think a lot right. of it had to do with the exercise that I was doing, but maybe that's because I like to think that. You know, <laughs> it's good. Maybe I have a bias. I would I would admit to that. Um, yeah. But having said that. You know there are things that you can do, and and certainly I, I don't think, I don't think my issues of, uh, you know, on the other hand, I could say, look, you know, I got to get a new hip right now. Maybe the maybe, and I had a whole heck of a lot of radiation. I wonder if that accelerated the the deterioration in my hip. Could have done. Yeah, it could. I, I, don't, I don't know. Could have could have easily done. You know. So right. uh, I, I don't know. I don't know. It, it's hard to pin that stuff. Anyway, I, I don't. Yeah, I'm not looking for answers particularly. Just throwing it out there, you know, because it's so, it seems so unusual to me. I hadn't heard of it. I mean, I've I've heard of people like, you know, like uh, Paul Hobson with compression issues right. and so forth, and other right. people with compression issues. But I'd never heard of the hairline fracture part of it. Right. Right, 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 right. You know, you know, tough to know. Tough, tough to know. Right. I, you know, the sad part is he's probably in pain, and that's not good. Right. And and he's an active person. He's not the kind of guy that likes sitting around. I mean, he 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 was a, an avid hiker, and he was uh, you know, he was out there. Right. So. Right. 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 Okay, um, we're still, we, we're going to go, anything else for you, Peter? Anything else you want to do? No I, th no, I think it's okay. We've had some healthy conversations. Okay. Um, Bill, over to you. Okay, so uh, I guess uh, the news that I have to report is I had another PSA test and uh, it's drifted up by two hundredths of a point um, from 1.06 to 1.08, which I consider to be negligible. So I'm really happy about that. So just uh, to remind um, you guys who know about my, have heard my past history or uh, if anybody doesn't know about it, I'm, uh, uh, as we were talking about earlier in the call, I'm BRCA positive and I'm taking this drug called Olaparib. And I had uh, numerous, uh, more than a dozen metastases uh, back about two and a half years ago now. And it uh, knocked them all down except for two. And it knocked my PSA down from about uh, 11 or 12 down to um, about one. And so this was good news. I mean, I don't, um, you know, I would have been uh, happier if it continued to go down, but as long as things remain stable, then uh, that, that's uh, good news to me. And then the other part of my report is that I had, I've had a lot of radiation damage because the mutation makes me susceptible to damage, even in normal cells. And then um, that's caused a lot of uh, pain issues in my pelvic region. And so, as some of you know, I had a pain pump installed in April. So this is a uh, something called an intrathecal pain pump that delivers a constant dose of narcotics, small amount of narcotics, at least a lot smaller than the large amounts of oral narcotics I had been taking directly to my spinal cord. And um, the, the idea here is that if, uh, you know, I'm no longer taking narcotics 
that are being delivered systemically, then I can get rid of a lot of the side effects of the narcotics. Um, so um, as Rick knows, this has been um, initially after the surgery to implant this pump, it was a, a, a tough uh, time. I had lots of uh, issues related to, you know, the, the drugs were causing my legs to turn to mush. And I'm also someone who really depends heavily on the ability to do things like hiking the mountains and things like that. But the good news here is that, boy, oh, boy, it's now that I'm, what is it, April, uh, uh, May, June, July, August. So we're four months out, and I feel great. <laughs> the pain is yes. pretty much all gone, except, you know, in the evening it ramps up a little bit, but uh, not that much. And during the day, I just feel um, wonderful. And I'm, my uh, cognitive abilities have increased. I've been able to write a science paper for the first time in about four years. And um, in the, you know, up, until, uh, up until now, and since I began to take large amounts of oral narcotics, I'd um, read the first paragraph of the paper and move on to the second, and I forget what the first paragraph said. So... Um, so that's my report. Things are going really, really well. And if anybody, you know, also has similar issues, I, I mean, the, 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 uh, the diagnosis that I have for the pain issues is pelvic pain syndrome. And if any of you develop that in the future or have it now, you know, you can talk to me and I can tell you about the pain pump. I had doubts about it, but it's turned out to be a, a wonderful thing. Um, oh, that's great, Bill. I'm glad to hear that. We, we, we're all we're all delighted. It is, it is great news, Bill. Yeah, great it news. really. Is. I'm, I guess I ought to plan on coming into Vermont a couple of times over the next twelve months to do some snowshoeing, to do some canoeing, some kayaking. I don't yeah. know. <laughs> I actually I can't rule out without doing a double blind study. I can't rule out the possibility that was uh, this was all. Um, an effect of your visit in Vermont. <laughs> <laughs> um, Bill, you uh, said... Right. Bill, you said... I'm, sorry? Ahead, Richard. I'm sorry? I'm finished. I, were yeah. you waiting for me to... No, Richard, did you want to say something? Okay. No, oh, I... I, I I did have a question though uh, because I was talking about you were talking about the intermittent uh, uh, Lupron shot and I was wondering if uh, uh, because I'm on the Garalex is the same thing for the Garalex or I was just wondering about when you to also when you talk about intermittent how long are you on and how long are you off okay let me let me come back to that. I just want to stay with Bill for the second. I thought you had a comment on Bill. I thought I heard you. No. So uh, we'll, we'll definitely, we've got plenty of time. We'll come back to you on that. Um, Bill, when, when did you, when was the 1.06? Uh, that was back, um, oh boy, Rick, I don't, I don't, remember sometime about four months ago around the time of the surgery to install the pain pump okay yeah that's what i figured and you know because i look here and i have a note that back in november your psa was down very low but then the enzalutamide i think stopped working and it started to jump up is that right or did i get my yeah, note that's right. right yeah so yeah I, I guess i should uh yeah, to, to be honest about all this, um, it did begin to drift up, um, and I can't remember how high it went. It didn't go that high. I think it was less than two. Does that? Do you have that in your notes? Well, what I have is that it, back in November, your PSA had dropped to 0.16 from 0.35, and that um, the enzalutamide had had some effect, but then you it started to stop working, 
and your PSA started to climb, and it just seems like it's just stabilized again right now, right around the one level. Right, yeah. So I did, uh, I went back on enzalutamide in, I, sometime this winter, because it was, uh, ri it, it had started to rise. Mm -hmm. And so I'm now taking both the uh, olaparib and the enzalutamide, and I should um, remind you that before I went on the Olaparib, I was on just the enzalutamide, and, uh, and that was no longer working as effectively as it had once been mm -hmm. uh, working. So meaning that my PSA was drifting up then too. Mm -hmm. So, you know, as a, you know, uh, uh, my thinking was that the combination of the two would probably be a lot better than either one alone and my oncologist disagreed and uh, and uh, convinced me to stop taking the enzalutamide for a while mm -hmm. um, which I um, you know I really disagreed with but I got tired of fighting with them but yes yeah, so then I when when th this past winter when uh, my PSA began to drift back up again while I was on Olaparib alone. Mm -hmm. I went back on the enzalutamide, and I'm still taking it. And the combination of the two seems to have stabilized things around one. Yeah. So it's not just the Olaparib. So I'm going to throw out I'm going to throw out a hypothesis because it can be no it can be no more than this unless you can figure out a way to test this, Professor. But um, I wonder whether the fact that your body is no longer stressed by pain the way that it has been for so long allows you to, uh, permits you to have a healthier immune system. And so the drugs are just more effective. The elaborate is more effective and the, your immune system is more effective. And maybe that's one of the, the fact that the pain pump was installed had like an indirect impact on how you can manage your prostate cancer. Well, I think you could be very, you could very well be right, Rick. I mean, I, I uh, never put much stock in, you know, the theory that the immune system could, or that stress could uh, impact the immune system and that could, you know, impact downstream things. Um, but uh, that was I would that was a really naive point of view, and I I think you're absolutely right that that could be, uh, you know, the the success that I'm having now is partly related to the reduced stress from not having chronic pain. Well, whatever now, it is, it's very well documented that pain can do lots of things. Because you know, has lots of physiologically right. documentable effects. Right. Whatever it is, we're all very happy. And um, whatever you're doing, don't change it. <laughs> yeah. Well, uh, yeah. I'm, I'm going to con have to, I'm going to talk to my oncologist to make sure that he doesn't change it. But um, you know, this time I'm not going to give in in that battle. Okay. And we'll support but, you. We'll be yeah, right behind you with Bill. Uh, bearing the standard, Bill. Um, let, let's let's come to Richard and and just follow up a little bit on the on the intermittent. So, um, first of all, I as far as I know, Richard, there's absolutely no difference between the agonist and the antagonist. So it shouldn't make a difference whether you're on Firmagon or if you're on Lupron or Zolodex or Trelstar or any of the others. However, I will say that when the <laughs> research was done. Um, by, uh, I, I am pretty certain the research was only done with the agonists because the, because the Firmagon never got approved until around 2012. So unless they were using it in a, um, in a trial, uh, I don't know whether they actually used intermittent, they tested intermittent theory, uh, intermittent hormone therapy with uh, an antagonist as well as with an agonist. I just don't know, but my but my gut tells me, and I'm not a doc. I can't I can't tell you that, but my gut tells me it should make no difference. Um, the as far as the time on and the time off, 
it just depends on each individual person. I mean, what, what, what happens is you go off the drug when you're stable and at a low level, and you stay off of it until usually you hit a given target that you and your medical oncologist have agreed when you started the, um, the holiday, the hiatus. And so for some men, it could be, uh, you know, if they're at insignificant, um, they may say, well, I'm going to go back home when I get to 5.0. Um, I've heard that some 2.0. A lot of it depends on you, the history of your disease, your oncologist, uh, what have you. Peter, do you, Peter, do you have a target with um, Turner? Yes, um, You're going to go Turner. back. No, no, I'm going to talk to him about it when I see him. Uh, and the the other thing, are you, are you measuring uh, your uh, testosterone as well as your PSA on a monthly or bi monthly basis, Richard? I'm not sure. I'm, I think the doctor measures mine. But yeah, I, I make, don't, make sure. I don't have so. Ask, ask him to ask him to test your testosterone regularly. How often do you do your PSA? Monthly or bi monthly? Every three weeks. Every three weeks. Every three weeks. Okay. Ask him to do testosterone as well, because you want to keep an eye on that. Um, if you go on intermittent, because that's uh, you know these things work hand in hand a little bit. I mean, you'll feel a lot better when you start getting testosterone, but you know that that could also trigger some uh, some warning stuff too. So you want to you want to be on top of all this stuff. Yeah. The the, the other thing. The, the other thing. And somebody has their uh, somebody has their volume turned up a little high. Turned up a little high. I'm, I'm going to turn my volume down a little bit. Um, the other thing, Richard, is that I. I recall that you were diagnosed with metastatic disease. Was that right? Yeah. Now I have I have metastatic disease right now. Yeah. But you were were, were you diagnosed with metastatic disease? No. Actually, uh, when I went off the uh, Firmagon, I I had radiation therapy, and then I. And I was on the Firmagon for uh, about a year, and then I went off of the Firmagon, and about six months or uh, or maybe nine months later, hello. Well, I think. Did we just lose you? Hello? I think we lost him. I was wondering whether we lost him. I was wondering whether we lost him. Lost him? Lost him? I'm getting some bad feedback. Getting some bad feedback. Um, let me, I still see Betty. Um, I still see him there. I'm not sure. Uh, We'll see if he comes back on. If he does, we'll, we'll, we'll continue. But my po the point that I wanted to make was, if you get diagnosed with metastatic disease and you're on hormone therapy from the very beginning, then they do seem to think that continuous treatment is better. Are you back on with us now, Richard? Richard? No, we lost him. I thought I saw him come back on. All right, guys. Well, look, we're we 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 filled up uh, two hours with a lot of good stuff, and there weren't that many of us. It's very nice once in a while to have a meeting where we don't have so many people and everybody gets plenty of time. It, it doesn't happen often enough. It makes it easier for the moderator, believe me, and you know it makes it easier for all of you because you don't feel so rushed and so precious. Um, I don't. Uh, uh, you know, I'll, I'll mention again, most of you know about PCRI, 
Um, if you are, let me, hold on a second. I see somebody's arrived. Richard, is that you back? That's me back. I don't know what happened. We lost you. Um, Richard, what I was going to say was this, that if you are diagnosed with metastatic disease, then continuous therapy is definitely better. In other words, if when they first started treating you, they suspected you had, um, you had metastatic disease, uh, then you're better off staying on it. If you were subscribed, if you were prescribed hormone therapy later, you're a much better candidate for intermittent therapy. And I don't know your, I think, okay. your situation. And you don't, you don't believe that there's a difference in going from uh, uh, Firmagon to Lupron would make a, a difference one way or another? You know, again, I'm not a doc, but I, I, I don't think so. Um, I, what I do think is most of the research was done with the agonists rather than the antagonists just because of the timing. But I can't see that there's any difference because the only real difference between the agonist and the antagonist is at the beginning. Having said that, there are people that switch to Firmagon and they get a better result. There are people that switch out of Firmagon and they get a better result. So some of the results from these drugs are, are very personal. I understand. I, I haven't had a problem with the Firmagon, so I'm not uh, okay. I'll probably stay with it. Okay, so you know, it's, it's, if you want to consider intermittent, then you, you you have to talk about that with Michael Morris and see what he whether he thinks you're a candidate or not. Yeah, I didn't. I didn't. Uh, uh, he didn't mention anything about that. He never mentioned it. I just was wondering about it when I he heard heard you talking. My guess is that given the nature of your cancer, which is certainly more complicated, because otherwise they would not be giving you carboplatin, you are probably not a candidate for intermittent. But that's that's not a medical opinion, it's just a guess. Okay. Good guess. Um, Thank you. Pleasure. So anyway, I just wanted to say, uh, let me know if you're going to PCRI, if you haven't told me yet. I don't think there's, other than Sylvester, anybody else on the call. Um, our next call will be on Monday, <clears throat> even though it's Labor Day. We, we don't take a break on Labor Day. We work right through. So uh, we'll be meeting 8 o'clock Eastern time on Labor Day. And... Um, and then we're into PCRI week. Um, so hopefully we'll have some really good videos to show you. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm fairly happy with the presentation I'm going to make. And I will be posting those slides on our uh, website probably before PCRI starts. So people can download them ahead of time if they want to. Um, OK. That's about it for tonight. Um, we've had some really good news. And really good news. I'm really happy. I'm happy. I'm happy. I'm happy. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. Good night, everybody. Good night. 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 Good night.